the recording. Perfect. Uh, so I think we better start. It's already 11. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work, and I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. Hi, everyone. My name is Paris Laiza Kanahi. Um, thank you for joining us and fitting another Architalk in your busy schedule. Um, we are delighted to welcome Russ Donaldson, one of the biggest advocates of decarbonization and sustainability in Western Australia and beyond. Um, Ross served as CEO and chairman at Woods Baggett from 2006 till uh, 2016 through its emergence as Australia's largest and the world's sixth uh, largest architecture practice. He serves on um, uh, the AIA's National Climate Action Task Force and he sits on uh, Curtin's School of Design and Built Environment Advisory Board and helps practices and young practitioners practitioners with defining the future. Um, welcome, Ross. It's a pleasure to have you here today, and thanks for accepting my invite. Over to you now. A pleasure. Um, thanks very much, Parisa. Um, okay, so I think I should go straight into sharing my screen, and we can get, get cracking. Um, through this this morning it should be let me know if that works perfect yes good <clears throat> um well that's uh, it's a pleasure to be um to be with you this morning um or whatever time you zone you're in um and i've uh, over a number of years i guess i've kind of re reflected on on where the where architectural practice is, is going uh where it should go not necessarily where it's going now but um there's some a number of themes that run through this, but today I want to focus primarily on on two things. One is the challenges that lay before us, and two is um, what um, what design intelligence and intelligent, <clears throat> you know, computational systems we can use to help us with that. And this comes from a talk that I actually gave at Curtin University about five years ago on the same subject. And at that point, I was, um, I have to say, um, expressing some sadness about the fact that. Um, we had a situation where <clears throat> um, architects were really focused on form and this is an example of another picture of Melbourne which is um, a song video by Beyonce and I think that that's probably yeah. really got got is that where we're going or is that, um, is that is that what the future holds for the profession? And there was quite a lot of it going on. A very different example again from Melbourne is this uh, ARM project which was celebrating um, a very prominent Aboriginal figure named w William Barrack, and and of course you 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 can't argue with um, th the need for such celebration. But again, I, I really wonder whether um, you know clever articulation of form of buildings is really you know the appropriate way. And 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 it seems to me that we've been through an era now of you know probably two decades where we've been rather too preoccupied with this. Um, and I think um, what we really should be thinking about is leaving a legacy within the communities within which we practice and serve. And I think the notion of service within the profession has, has really sort of been a bit lost. And therefore, you know, move away from, um, from uh, clever formal articulations as a primary energy and focus for our creative endeavors to something more about leaving an intellectual capital in our work. Um, and um, you know, moving away from stylistic innovation to more of a programmatic invitation, innovation and, and um, driving intellectual content within the pro projects and their program and the, <clears throat> the performance of the buildings, excuse me. And, <clears throat> and this is a strong theme of this presentation that the digital age presents us with, with this opportunity to, to really move the profession um, rapidly. And there are, I'm gonna talk about the reasons why this should be quick. Um, into an area where we're much more technically uh, enabled and and, um, and capable, and of course the, we've got some amazing, extraordinary, and scary um, uh, challenges in front of us. And I guess it's a question of whether the profession really wants to take a leadership role in in things like um, dealing with um, the explosion of urban migration and the climate change impacts of, of these. So. Something like two and a half billion people um, are going to be moving into the cities in, in the next 30 years, um, which is going to create a, a massive challenge in terms of how much is built. And 
is it going to be built like this? Um, and this tends to be the trend where people move from the countryside into urban fringes and all around the world. It tends to be, um, you know, a, a, an ad hoc kind of, um, of development, uh, which has some romantic appeals to it, but from a functionality point of view and, and many other factors, it probably leaves, is, is a bit wanting. So currently, uh, it's estimated it was in 2014, um, anyway, that, that there were about 150 billion square metres of building in the world. Now, so what is this, what is the impact of this urban migration going to have? Well, um, and that this was, these are, these are um, stats from five years ago. At that point, it was being predicted that by 2030, there would be another 80 billion square metres of, of new buildings and rebuilt buildings in urban areas. 80 billion square metres. And that by 2050, it would be 150 billion square metres. So in the next 30 years, it's anticipated that we will build the world all over again. Some of it by demolishing what we've got and some of it through new, new buildings. And under a no change scenario, if we keep doing it the way we've been doing it, this movement of urban migration will itself add 50% to the carbon emissions by 2050 just in the urban migration alone. So we, we, can't un, we can't overstate the challenges before us. And, and I guess I keep asking myself the question is, you know, where does the architectural profession sit in this? Um, and where is our determination to be impactful? You know, we, we, we've got a major skill set in the construction industry, um, but one might question the breadth of its application. So our challenge um, and, and the focus of this talk really is that to, to design high performance buildings and cities uh, from an environmental and a social perspective, uh, social in terms of performance for societies and communities. So just uh, starting with climate change and you know, starting a bit negatively, starting with a bit of a dark story really, I suppose, but I, I, I hope you feel by the end that uh, it's much more optimism um, in what I'm proposing. And I think there's, um, there's plenty of discussion. It's, it's wonderful how this conversation is evolving. I think uh, there's, there's very broad understanding and appreciation now that, that we really have to have major impacts by 2030. So again, for our profession, what does that mean? Um, well, I think it means we must be doing zero carbon buildings by 2030. Um, and this chap, uh, Johan Rockstrom from the Potsdam Institute, I think is for me a great source of uh, data around, um, you know, how serious this challenge is. And, and he talks to some, amongst many other things about the, um, that nine of the world's major planetary systems have begun to tip. Um, with, amongst those, we're seeing the death of ice in the Arctic. And by 2030, we can expect the sea to be open through the Arctic. Um, the Western glaciers of Antarctica seem to be at a tipping point. And once they roll into the ocean by themselves, they will raise the sea level by two metres. And of course, the Great Barrier Reef, 50% uh, of it has, has died already. So um, why in recent years we've been ignoring these things is a separate conversation for another kind of topic, probably with a different kind of panel of people involved. But um, these things are happening, but, but they're not front of mind in driving our behaviour. And so the Earth is warming at about 170 times faster than it has in the last 7,000 years of the Holocene interglacial period, which is the period where, you know, the, the, the um, archaeological period we're in now, 170 times faster. And the two degrees increase, which of course we're now moving it to a focus on 1.5 degrees, um, the tipping point shifts the Earth from a self-cooling mechanism, which is, you know, we could, it's another, again, another topic of, how the mechanisms maintain the Earth's balance, um, but it'll tip from a self-cooling mechanism to an unstoppable, irreversible self-heating um, system, uh, which is what Potsdam Institute describes as the, a hothouse Earth, with temperature increases, you know, anything up to eight degrees and oceans rising anything up to 60 meters. So uh, it'll be a completely different world, you know, um, and much of that could be as near as the end of the century. So again, um, for us as architects in our profession, um, I think it's it's a simple focus we should be having, and that is that we should be designing zero carbon buildings by 2030. All buildings should be zero carbon design and construction by 2030. Um, as, as Parisa mentioned, I'm on the Institute's Climate Action Task Force, um, and we produced a report in November last year that, that uh, showed a pathway to 
um, decarbonising this construction industry in Australia by 2030. Um, and that's going to require a, a major um, re-engineering of practice and education uh, by 2025 because buildings take, you know, sometimes as much as five years, if not longer, to procure. So if, from the point of designing, uh, we should be, if we want the buildings being built to be zero carbon by 2030, we're going to have to be ready to be doing that within four years. And that means all graduates from schools of architecture would have to be fully enabled and capable in zero carbon design. And all practicing architects would also have to be fully capable. Now that requires, as I say, a very comprehensive re-engineering of practice and education. And to do that, we need all the tools we can get. Um, and last year we put together a, a, a lecture series on zero carbon design that I, I did with a bunch of engineers for the Institute of Architects, which is about to be rerun by the Institute of Engineers actually um, later in the year. So digital tools, we're, we're lucky in that sense because the, comp the world of computational modelling has advanced to a point where we have at our hands now the tools to enable us to do this. We know the basic drivers for, for decarbonising our buildings and there's a simple diagram here um, that you know, moves from passive design through to eliminating fossil fuels, you know, operational energy, embodied energy, um, creation of renewable energies um, and uh, considering whole of life carbon is obviously very important. Um, it's not just uh, you know, the, the building we build today, it's, it's the whole of life of the carbon that we put into that building. And as I was saying, there, there are now emerging and uh, you know, available tools for modelling um, the life cycle uh, of the carbon and the water within, within our buildings. The, and one of them is very close at hand. Um, a terrific guy named Richard Haynes uh, has built a, a platform called eTool, uh, which is uh, based in Western Australia, but it's being used uh, around the world. Um, and this is a whole of life cycle assessment tool. And um, just to very simply and you know, quite crudely introduce it, you take a, a BIM model into the platform, Revit or whatever, um, and this is a very simple tool, a very simple illustration that he built uh, for the for the lecture series we've put together. Um, so you take it in, you, you take a smart model, a, a Revit model into into the platform, and it will give you a readout of the carbon across a whole range of parameters um, in in the building. Um, and it, this includes transport and water, um, end of life uh, factors, needs for maintenance and, and renewal during the life of the project. Um, and um, to help the designers, what it then does is that it orders them from greatest impact at the top, it's the bricks, the blocks and the pavers, um, the clay bricks and, and so forth. This is a brick, brick building, so not surprisingly. Um, so it enables the designers to then start uh, trying new iterations of different materials and then reworking it in the model to see and to drive that carbon down both in terms of operational and embodied energy. So this is a, a very smart model that's that's available now that architects should either be commissioning as a subconsultancy to their work or um, you know acquiring the, the, the application um, techniques and a capability within their practices, certainly larger practices um, I think there are signs now that they're moving towards in-housing these kinds of tools. And here's a terrific piece of work that would be familiar to many people at Curtin. Um, it's been developed by um, two young guys, um, Tristan Morgan and, and Dan Daniel Jeffrey. Um, when you can see here, see at the bottom left, you see 80,000 uh, kilograms of carbon, and then it's just sh shifted to 21,000. And on the right hand side, they're illustrating the, the parametrics grasshopper environment within which they're changing the, the, the materials here. And they're experimenting with, you can see now, column width, column depth, rafter width and depth. Um, and um, simply clicking, basically clicking alternative um, um, materials and components, but also changing the shape and the design of the building, the roof form and trying to drive down the, the amount of material being used in the building. Um, and you can see that we're now back up to a more, an 80,000, now we're back down to 43,000 with the different um, iterations that they're going through. Um, so you can see there a live model where you can interact with um, uh, you know, a live three-dimensional smart model and be changing elements um, and reading the carbon as you're doing it. Now this is, this is the ultimate goal, isn't it? To, to be able to, designers to be sitting at their computers working on the building 
in Revit or, or whatever. Um, and in a parametric uh, environment, uh, driving the carbon down in real time as they're doing it. They can interact with their clients as they're doing that as well. And so you can see two outputs here. They've experimented with um, box beam and solid beam um, options. And the solid beam options, the carbon is 57,000 um, kilograms and the box beam is 21,000. Massive saving in carbon just on that. And look at the shift in the in the water and, and in the energy. So um, this is the world that exists now. This is not a future. Um, and this is this is how we should be operating. And um, that's built on an EPIC database, which comes out of the University of Melbourne. And, uh, and um, we're also um, obviously having to do this within a, an environment of a circular economy, increasingly, where we're designing waste out of our buildings, designing buildings so that um, there is very little waste generated during the, the component manufacturers and construction, and the buildings are conceived in a way um, that they can be recycled. Um, there are people in, in Europe now who are starting to do schedules of recycling of their buildings. They're taking the uh, you know BIM model and creating a, a picture of a bank of all materials and components in that um, in that building for future recycling, uh, which is a, a very interesting form of, of, of investment. And I guess this is I include this just as a kind of a, um, I don't know a kind of a, I suppose a bit of a wake up call, but. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, focus on the potential future of hydrogen um, in in our in our energy generation, um, but it's it we have to be very mindful of how slow we've been going and the challenges of the time frame because the Orkney Islands have been operating on hydro. I mean, it's obviously a low density as you can see from the image, but the Orkney Islands have been operating on a on a wind power and hydrogen storage for fuel cell generations. Um, for about 15 years now. Th this technology that is being touted now as being a new revolution and talking about it being a future in maybe 10 years time is already a 15 year old um, sort of application. So um, there's a bit of a wake up for us here, I think. Now, so shifting off uh, climate deliverability, I, I introduced the, the, the talk saying that it was about both climate and, and the social agenda of livability. We, and, and I'm going to now talk about um, some of the parametric um, computational applications that, that can assist with building performance, notions of livability, but also performance. Um, and a number of years ago, I mean, this, gosh, this is already um, uh, pushing 10 years ago. I was speaking at a conference on world class cities in, in Istanbul and put this, this first bit of this material together. So this is kind of backgrounding, but it's an introduction to moving towards smarter modeling. Um, and we looked at the notion, of, I was asked to speak about livability in cities and, and um, took the Economist Intelligent Unit Index, which measures livabilities of cities. I mean, it's, you could argue whether it's an appropriate framework, but um, let's not, um, because I'm gonna move on from it. But they talk about stability, healthcare, culture and environment, education, infrastructure as their measures. And it struck me at the time that, you know, these are things that architects can have impacts on. So why don't we explore it further? So what we did is we modelled, um, and of course, livability applies to all contexts, not just cities like Melbourne and Manhattan, which um, we typically talk about. Um, so we modelled um, a number of cities based on the distribution of uh, the so-called the social amenity, education, um, you know, health, arts, um, and others. And what we found um, typically in, in cities that were <clears throat> considered to be highly livable is the disaggregation of the of the social and the community amenity throughout the fabric of the city. And this is a theme I'm now going to build on. So <clears throat> you tend not to have in these cities um, art centres and, and education precincts and so forth. You, you have, have them embedded throughout the fabric, disaggregated throughout the fabric of the city. And uh, one really good example of that is Manhattan, um, which again um, has a highly disaggregated distribution of um, of the social and community amenities through through the various mixed use parts of the city, and of course one of the features of Manhattan is that it's it's a it's a great mixed use city, um, and here you can see on the right hand side uh, an indication of that in terms of you know, obviously there's concentration in the commercial district uh, just below Central Park, um, but interestingly um, even that area just below Central Park on the top right there has a residential density of 11,000 people per square kilometre um, in a part of the city that we think of as just being high-rise office buildings. 
um, even there, it's uh, it's very it's got a high level of um, residential population, um, and the interesting thing about this kind of scale and fabric of city, um, uh, which I'll um, enumerate on in a minute, is that it's actually a great model for efficient energy systems. You know, combined district district um, integrated uh, combined heat and power systems. If you want to have a a city that is going to optimise the way you, you, you distribute energy, um, then you're looking for a city that has around about 150, at least 150 residential units per hectare if you want to optimise it, um, and an equal number of, of uh, area of commercial because obviously the daytime, nighttime optimisation for energy consumption. And the village, um, which surprised me in that, in that lower area, um, has 245 uh, units per hectare, 2.4 million square metres, and a very similar area of office space, 2.2 million square metres. Um, so this creates a picture of a, um, you know, a city that, a city model that is sort of optimum for, um, for energy, um, but also considered to be highly livable. But that modelling um, isn't smart modelling. It's simply that you could have done it by hand. We did it by computer, but you're overlaying from data an, inform you know, an information set of uh, where things are. But you need to move. We need to move on from um, from that to a to a much smarter modelling of, of, uh, of the city. And this I'm now going to illustrate that um, with some work that was done by a fantastic group of um, computational models that we set up in Woods Bagot uh, that went under the name of Superspace, led by a, one of the leading people, I think, in the world, uh, Christian Derricks, in this area. And so then what he took is he started mining the data sets, and New York is great because it has lots of data sets that you can mine um, and access, and it's, real, it's mostly free. Um, and we started modelling on a neighbourhood level um, where everything was, for a simple term. And here's some of the, the um, visualisations of those maps. Um, but the key thing is that these maps are, are drawn from a, from a database they're intelligent maps. There's there's real number and dimension sitting beneath these these models, um, and he did it across a whole range of parameters, um, including where the restaurants were, where the bars were, where the cafes, shops, supermarkets, um, as well as um, you know the grain, the land use, uh, where all the other land uses were, and the amenities and so forth, um, and then built built a model. Um, with all this data to start looking at where things were. So here's the, the starting um, illustration of, of the building of that model. And on the left hand side, we've got um, an indication of some of those parameters that have been built into this model. Um, so we've got numbers of floors, we've got um, how wide the street frontage uh, of the block is, the floor area ratios, what's commercial, what's office, what's, resi you know, what's residential and what's retail and so forth where the subways are, access to subways, where the cafes, education, libraries are. And what the map builds is that it, at a neighbourhood level, it starts looking at how far from any location within that neighbourhood on average things are. So this is um, no, NoHo, north of Houston versus Soho, which is south of Houston. Um, and um, uh, on the right hand side, but we've got all of the districts of um, of, uh, of Manhattan on on the left there, all of them, all of those neighbourhoods have been mapped um, and built into this database. And on the across the right, you see all of the parameters that have been recorded within it. And down the right hand side, there's an extraction of that detail from the NoHo, so you can do it for each of them. So on average, the number of floors is 6.8. The building depth is 29 metres. The building frontage is 17 on average. Um, the block densities, networks, and so forth. Um, uh, for um, for a ratio, we've got the different um, uh, how much is of each type of land use is there, how far on average it is to the to the subway entrance, 211 metres. So in in NoHo, on average, you're within 211 metres of a subway. You're in with 150 metres of a cafe. You're within 354 metres of an education building. Uh, you're within 462 metres of um, a library and 141 of an open space. So this is, a, this is a very intelligent model that's been built, which can be used uh, for all sorts of um, devices um, and, and objectives. So um, we then adapted uh, this model to show us which blocks in the city um, fitted within that narrow band of um, 
high levels of community um, amenity, high level of accessibility to public transport, high level of accessibility to hospitals and education and so forth. And the graph on the left, um, and you can do, one could do this manually if it was live, can show you how you can adapt those parameters and show you which parts of the city fit the parameters you're looking for. And we, uh, as a, a sort of a case study, um, we, we then overlaid that about where the tech sector was, um, was renting. We, we had reasons for being interested in what the tech sector was doing as the early days of when tech was invading, um, literally invading New York and New York was becoming a tech hub of its own. Um, and um, we just started plotting where tech was renting. And what we saw was that they were selecting and making choice about where they wanted to rent based on these parameters of accessibility to um, subways, to community amenities, to um, social amenities and so forth. And so there was a pattern of relationship between the kind of performance of the city in terms of its amenity um, and where people were renting. So for the, for, the, for the real estate market, of course, this is you know, fascinating potential gold to understand how different sectors of the market are choosing um, locations within a city um, and, uh, and what are the parameters that, that that part of the city has that they're obviously attracted to. Now, one could reverse engineer this, of course. If this is telling us certain aspects of what livability looks like, they could be reverse engineered into design in terms of urban design. Um, and we can then start doing it with a degree of predictability about um, um, how the city is going to perform in, a, in relation to um, uh, in relation to our desired outcomes. I'm just going to explore that a little bit more. Um, and uh, Christian Derricks, who did this work, uh, then you know, put it onto his, uh, onto his phone. So, and that was live. You could manipulate it by touching the screen, changing the parameters and seeing uh, how, how the distribution uh, shifted in the city as you changed the parameters you were, you were considering. Parameters being those things, you know, where's the cafe, where's the subway entrance, where's the park, where's the hospital. Um, and to, at that point, we were, um, we were making presentations in Manhattan to um, people in the development industry. And so we, we tuned this part of it a little bit to their interest. And, but I don't want to overemphasize that this is what it was all about because Ultimately, it's about re, you know building building platforms that can inform how you design cities um, for livability and use and and, uh, and and quality of life and all sorts of things like that. So, um, but within the model, he was able to um, fully model where all the buildings were, how many floors they're in, how much area was um, um, in that building, and even what was available, what was on the market, and how much it cost, what was the area of it, what was the rate per square meter. Um, and so you link that in terms of being able to map where space is to the previous work on uh, what kind of amenity is available from those sorts of uh, parts of the city, um, then obviously you've got a, a potential for a, a incredibly well-informed uh, decision-making about where you might want to rent and who you're trying to rent to. Um, and the one we developed, as I said, in detail was uh, what the tech sector was doing. Um, and even to the point where it became illustrated in a 3D model, uh, illustrating where they were and what floor it was on. Um, and on the right hand side, you can then see, um, you know, how far it is to a bar, how far it is to a cafe, an art uh, facility, a theatre, park, subway, and it could also do it for hospitals and so forth. Um, so, you know, there's, there's tremendous um, potential in terms of the richness of understanding the city and how to design and how to change it when it is changing it. So, um, and that to move this on to the, to the next level and sort of getting back down to a, to a more of a building scale, um, what, what we were doing was we were modeling, ex you know, the experience, the behaviors, and then turning that into a, to a spatial model, a spatial design simulation. Um, and this is relevant because um, even more so since COVID, I think, uh, um, the performance of, of well, in this case, workplaces um, and understanding how they're, how they're going to behave, how people are going to use them, what are going to be the patterns of use is obviously really critical, um, more, more and more so. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, we're sort of talking about high performance workplaces, all about creative productivity. And, and this is the example I'm going to, to share today. It's about the notion of adjacency. Um, creative productivity in office buildings um, is a lot about who's next to whom, 
uh, in what kind of grouping and how far away they are from each other and people of other skill sets. So on a sort of micro scale, it's equivalent to what we've been talking about in terms of who's where in the city and, and what they're looking for in terms of access to services and amenities. So the notion of um, adjacency, and this um, again is some work done by Tristan uh, in, in his role at uh, Cox, um, looking at that building a, a smart model of adjacency. Um, and this, uh, um, you know, I'm not going to try and explain the, the density of this. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in here, but, it, but the key to it is that we're building smart objects for space. So a certain particular, um, in this case, semi-open project zone, um, how many people, uh, what's it there for, collaboration, innovation, how many of them are there, what's the area, what's the total area, um, seats and, and so forth. So you build a model that has embedded within it um, the intelligence and the knowledge um, uh, of this level of detail. And then you work towards patterns of relationships and adjacencies. And I'm going to explore the adjacency one in a bit more detail now to illustrate the point. So you, again, you take it through a, a, a smart mo smart modeling environment and ability to adapt it, manip manipulate it, in this case, uh, Grasshopper, um, and uh, working in smart modeling adjacency graphs, um, and then relating that to to, to a floor plan. Um, there's a lot in this, so I won't try and explain everything, but uh, but in a moment you'll, I think, get the point. Um, so you're, bu you're building a richer and richer model of where everything is, what are the critical arrangements, uh, adjacencies, and therefore, what is the optimum arrangement? How do you place all of the people and their associated users, behaviors and needs, what kind of facilities and amenities that, that they need and want? How do you optimize the placement of that in the building? Now, architects do this intuitively and some do it extremely well, um, but in more and more complex buildings, uh, I think uh, if we wanna be sure about how they're gonna perform, and particularly that we only build as much as we need and we don't build excessive space, um, then we're gonna need these tools and we should be using them because they're now available. Um, and then modeling people flows, circulation patterns, um, desire lines, why people move through space and the pattern they do, understanding that and being able to model that is important um, as in, in terms of building the model. So then you've got the adjacency set, that's the full data set. Um, and then you can use that adjacency set to, um, to determine where to place things in an optimum arrangement and, um, it's in, and trying to optimize the building. So that system can give you a layout for all of the users um, and where they should be. And here's an animated model that was done by, the previous work was all done by Tristan. And this is done by Christian Derricks again. Um, and this is showing a, a kind of an AI version of that where um, you're, you're experimenting with different parameters, moving them around and it's showing how all of the all of the accommodation is uh, reallocated through the floor, floor plate as one is experimenting with different um, different parameters. You, you are optimizing the, the arrangement. Now, if you can do this at a building level, you can do it at a city level. So that kind of folds back and relates to um, the, the kind of work we're showing in the Manhattan example of uh, adjacencies um, and distribution and efficiencies. And efficiency is a great, it's got a lot of lot to do with this and invariably efficiency then relates to productivity. Um, and, um, and obviously businesses should be interested in this, but at a community level and a social level, it also relates to issues of the, 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 the data sets can be shifted to other sorts of drivers. Of course, once you're working in a parametric model environment, um, you can model all sorts of different parameters. And this could be about issues of social equity um, in a city. It may not be about productivity in, a, in an office building. Um, it could be about um, e equity of access to community amenities within, within a neighborhood um, and so forth. So it, 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 the point is the, the process and the intelligence of the model, and then it's for the designer to choose the, the appropriate, with working with a client, to choose the appropriate parameters to be testing. So let's just move on back out to the urban scale to, to the final, final part of this talk um, and, and drill down a little bit more into some of those um, data sets and, and uh, the modeling. So I mentioned earlier about um, it's important to understand how people move and what are the drivers for why people circulate in systems uh, in cities in particular ways and which, which pathways become um, you know, the highest use. And one of those parameters um, uh, first 
began uh, the first experiment with trying to understand that was done by Bill Hillier's team at the Bartlett uh, in the Space Syntax Studio that, that he built there from the 80s. So you know, this is an idea that's already 40 years old, really, um, but it's becoming more and more sophisticated in its application. Um, but view lines and view corridors were deemed to be critical in understanding the way people understood a city, how they found the way through it, and therefore what kind of patterns of use they developed over time. So view corridor analysis at a three-dimensional level um, is a very important part of that. It's, uh, um, this is some work that, again, Christian Derex has done. And this is an example of, I won't say what it is, but it happens to be a project in Perth with the redevelopment of a super block um, looking at um, uh, different options for how to circulate through the space and how it might um, engender certain kinds of movement. And uh, what the modelling done was it modelled in three dimensions what the view corridor throughs were through were, um, you know, um, looking to the F and B, um, uh, being able to see the the arts through through to commercial, looking both ways the transport to art. So it's looking at um, views from one location to another location um, to understand uh, which ones were going to work better. Um, so that kind of three-dimensional modelling of, of being able to predict how people will uh, circulate and use the space um, not only has something to do with efficiency and, and convenience, but it may also have a big factor in drivers for where you put retail within developments and, and where you might locate an access to a subway. Um, uh, so as, you know, in our case, uh, an underground. Um, uh, and, you know, how you place all the different potential. So this is... Um, this is not the Perth example. This is the um, Potsdamer Platz in in, uh, in uh, Berlin, which I'm going to come back to in a minute, actually. Um, but I mentioned earlier that uh, we can we can search any kind of parameters and decide which ones to build our model on. This one um, is um, looking at a project in Sydney, again by Christian Derex, um, and looking at a um, a particular location that was being considered for development and trying to understand. Um, again, the availability and proximity to services and amenities. You may not be able to read it in the screen share mode, but it talks about childcare, preschools, uh, medical centres, art galleries, community facilities, libraries, again, um, co-working spaces and primary schools. Um, and the mapping shows where they are, um, not only how close they are, but how accessible they are, taking the same syntax model, the highly red areas are showing high uses of circulation. So it's ultimately starting to map how these facilities in their placement are spatially integrated with the location one is considering to build and therefore potentially considering, well, it's too inconvenient, too far to a particular kind of facility, we'll have to build a new one as part of this development. So those are the kinds of considerations that um, will bear on, on a design at this sort of scale. Um, that's probably a bit fuzzy, so I won't dwell on that. Um, but there's all sorts of um, um, parameters that one might be might be modelling. In this case, um, another project in in Sydney, um, where the the demographic profiling covers um, all sorts of things. Um, people, what kind of education people have got? Whether they've got postgraduate, you know, what with their bus users or train users or car users, or what the income levels are, um, or what kind of rents they're paying. Um, so you're getting a profile of potential, you know, a cross section of the community that you're designing with. Um, and this example is uh, from California. Um, again, looking at a variety of parameters for, for the diff different um, parts of Los Angeles um, and how different parts of the city have different kinds of amenity. Um, and you can be using this for a decision about what, where one should be building. You know, governments can be using this kind of modeling to be considering where they need to be placing amenities and, and how to place them, not only in terms of proximity, but how they fit into the circulation system so their accessibility is, is maximised. Um, and you start mapping the profiling of, of people with the movement patterns, and then you're starting to get a very rich picture of the kind of city into which you're um, building and the kind of decisions you can make um, about how to do so. Um, this example is age groups, but um, you know that that, that may be a, a very significant factor depending on the project. And just um, getting towards the wrap up now, um, the um, 
this profiling um, can be used to, to build a very highly sophisticated predictive model of the likely behaviours. Um, in this example, again, the, the Berlin example I mentioned earlier, um, gets to the point where, and this is the access to the, um, the underground there, um, and it, it's showing based on what's within the development and around the development, what profile of people are likely to be moving through in what numbers through which parts of the fabric of that development. Now you can imagine, you know, uh, somebody who's, who's running the retail um, uh, for this development, being very interested in understanding what's the profile of the kinds of people moving through um, different and accessing it through different, based on where they're coming from. So um, the, and then you know, not only where they're coming from, but who they are. Um, and where they're going to. So um, the, there's a potential for very sophisticated decision making um, around this. And this obviously tends to be sort of suggesting a commercial imperative for this kind of decision making. Um, but it can be uh, equally applied, as I sort of alluded to earlier, from you know social amenity, community amenity, and decision making around that. But the the key thing in you know to, in the past, I think architects and city planners have mostly been guessing this stuff, um, but we've now got capacity to model these things. Um, the, so the two the two key key themes, um, and you can, you can model it in terms of uh, ultimately productivity, what kind of infrastructure you need, what are the quality of life factors, descent, depending on the design decision you're making, equity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, all these things can be be measured as outputs. And then once you've done that in the city and you've built the model, you can use it as an ongoing model, basically a digital twin for the management of the city in terms of future decision making. Um, so it's, it potentially creates a, a, huge, a, a, a very high value asset for, for, for people in governance and decision making. And I guess the, the key theme there is, is twofold, uh, well threefold, I guess the, the digital age presents us with an opportunity for driving much higher performance in, in environmental performance of the fabric and in the operation of our buildings um, and much higher productivity and, uh, and quality in how the build, buildings work for us, for the users and how they enhance behaviour. So I think my brief was to get through in around about uh, 40, 45 minutes in case there are any questions. Um, so um, I might hand it back to Parisa. Thank you so much, Ross. Fantastic. Thanks for the insightful presentation. It was very um, eye-opening and interesting to see how smart modeling environment and optimization to the use of technology and AI could help us achieving a decarbonized environment or in just a broader term, um, cities, better cities for living. So that's fantastic to see all these achievements. Um, I guess I just open the forum to participants. If uh, anyone has any question, um, you can either type in the chat box or um, just feel free to turn on your microphone and ask questions. I think the first person is Francesco Mancini. Thanks, Parisa. Thanks, Ross. This is uh, fantastic to, to see, which, which will, you know, with the level of synthesis that is <laughs> outstanding, really. I have I have so many questions. Probably we should catch up for a coffee, but uh, <laughs> it's it's fantastic. Um, but my main question, I think, uh, is a twofold one. Uh, you have showed uh, basically a work that you have, um, and rightly so, contained within within a specific ecosystem, which has the built form at the core, um, and the use of the space, of course, and the user. Uh, my question is. Are you starting exploring what happens when you introduce, uh, well, the, the whatever is be below the, the ground line, which means the land itself, water and 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 and, and, and green uh, ecology. In other words, how to expand this system and 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 grasp these are the level of complexity. Many of the reasoning that you have uh, presented today depends on land use that you are strictly interconnected with that. Uh, possibly this new uh, way of looking at macro 
data at city and micro level together with the micro level could lead to a different way to manage land use uh, and, and distribute land because you may imagine that you had more equity between city centers or maybe the notion of city center as we know it is going to disappear. I mean, it's, a, it's, so, it's so opening to this, to this new question in terms of equity and sustainability. But I would like to hear from you where this work sits in this, in this, in this next level context. Um, well, if I understand the, 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 yeah. the core main part of your question, Francesco, it's um, uh, what's going on below the building in, in the land and, and how that impacts on, on decisions about um, yes. development and distribution. Yes. Well, I, it's, it's one of the, um, I guess for me, one of the transformative um, uh, things for me over the years was when I first le learned about parametrics, it was all about um, manipulating form and shaping dimension and, and so forth. You know, amazingly, amazing young people doing extraordinary things, manipulating form in a parametric environment. When it became apparent to me that um, parametrics al allows you to use any parameter, um, as long as you can measure it and give it number, um, and then you can start building models to work out how certain parameters relate to other parameters. Um, and all you need to do, all one needs to do is to understand the relationship between, between them. So if you can get the data, I mean, this definitely is not my, my field of expertise, this, this part of it, but if you can get the data and what sits below the ground and what's there um, to any depth, and these days there's usually quite an increasing amount of information of that available, then uh, then you can model it. And, and I see no reason why it couldn't start informing decision making about where to put things and also to understand the implications. You know, once you cap a piece of land with a solid piece of concrete, what is that going to do to the to the dynamics of what sits below? Um, so I see no limitations in that regard. And that's one of the beauties of the whole notion of the, the parametric world is param parametrics was in very simple terms, the relationship between this bit and this bit and if you change this bit what does it do to that bit i mean you know in simple terms that's what it was in physical dimensional space but now we can do it in in um within the within a much more comprehensive digital world thanks ross um, nathaniel belcher yes um ross thanks thanks very much for uh, that, that talk, I, I, I have to apologize, I, I have to run, but I did want to get your thoughts about, um, as someone that has, I had extensive experience both in education and in practice, and what you would communicate to um, either our school or it, the other two schools in the area, what do you think our role is in this critical process? As we, you know, there's a great deal of, I think, momentum that keeps coming and going around sustainability. And this has happened when I started in school, it was a thing that it kind of went away and it came, it rides with politics. But um, the profession and the role of practice is, is continual. And what would you say to either educators or young students uh, is the most critical thing for us to be doing right now as we look at, you know, the, the current anxiety around sustainability, net zero, the transition to electricity and all that stuff is coming up again. Everything from hydrogen cells. What's the role of our professional or our, or our staff as, as practitioners? Thanks again for your talk. Yeah, great question, uh, Nathaniel. Um, the, the key thing is, I think this stuff used to seem really hard. It used to be incredibly complex, um, you know, trying to understand how to design a building so you really understood what you were doing with the carbon footprint, for example, or, how to design a city so you could reasonably have any confidence about what the performance outcomes were going to be. But I think one of the glorious things about the, the kind of crisis point we are at the moment is we now have access to incredibly sophisticated tools to enable us to perform as a profession at a much, much higher level. And I think it's our obligation to do so. I, I think we, we, owe it to our society that we approach this on the basis that we are we provide a service to our society we're not architecture has to move on from it being um, a kind of playground for talented people to design stuff that they feel excited about it can't be right now it can't be a personal playground anymore i think we have to and to some extent i think we've fallen into the trap in the past of, of training architects to think it is a kind of personal playground you know we've got creative skills let's have some fun 
I think we need to focus at much more, this all sounds very serious, but much more on what service we provide and what we can uniquely provide as a profession, what our unique contribution can be that others can't do, the skill sets that we have with the tools that we now have available to us. So we've got to get on with it. And uh, from an education point of view, we've got to start making sure the students um, graduate with those skills and those, they don't have to be able to do all the parametric stuff themselves, but they have to have the sufficient knowledge to work comfortably with a colleague who does. Thanks for that. Um, Tristan Morgan. Uh, thanks, Parisa. Um, and uh, thanks, Ross, for the, the great presentation. I'm incredibly flattered that you talk about me amongst someone as, you know, like Christian Derricks. Um, I guess my question is probably similar to um, Nat's one, but I was really interested in, I guess, the, the kinds of skills and, and experiences and expertise that are going to be required in the practice of the future. And I guess the practice of the future in many ways is not going to be the same as the practice of today and, and how we might see it being reconfigured and whether you see um, what that practice looks like. Um, and, and what kind of business models it might engage in? Um, well, I mean, we could we could work in a world where we have practice a bit like it is now, and we have emerging and growing consultancies who specialise in in all of this modelling. I think an optimum. The problem with that is that the the the, the separation of those skill sets often leads to a kind of oppositional, um, or sometimes a threatening relationship. But I think the optimum is that these skill sets are embedded within practice. So you've got people who become incredibly good at, at getting data, and then people who, they may be the same people, they might be different people, who know how to work with that data to turn it into um, models, artificial models, artificial intelligent models of space, um, so that at the same time we can be seeing what the performative outcomes will be. Um, and that uh, they work with the designers. Now, there will be practices where there will be very talented designers who will be driven to acquire these skills themselves. Fantastic. But complex buildings, increasingly complex buildings and cities require teams. Um, and I think uh, in, in my perspective is that in an ideal world, these teams are embedded. That's why I built the super space group at Woods Baggett, embedded within the business. Um, but quite honestly, um, in the, you know, it, a number of years it was operating there, um, there were mixed mixed successes in terms of the ability for, our, for the designers to engage with those guys because they hadn't been brought up with it, they weren't trained in it, so it was a bit of a mystery and sometimes a threat. And that's why the key role of education is to make sure that all graduates have sufficient knowledge and working application of these sorts of things so that they can work comfortably with the people who then take that on to be their specialisation. Because um, I think uh, the, the risk is people will, um, you know, designers will have a, you know, a, a computational geek there um, and do the work and then ask the computational person to apply what they know to have already been done. The key, and the same thing is true of sustainability. High performance, uh, high performance in energy and in carbon buildings will come from highly integrated collaborative environments where no decisions are made in advance of the modelling. So typically we're still sitting in a situation where someone will design a building and ask somebody to test what the performative outcomes of that will be. We've now got an environment where that can be happening coincidentally, not, not one thing following the other. So the integration rather than things being happening in a linear fashion, one thing after the other is going to be the key to it. I hope that covers your question, Tristan. Thank you. Next is Justin and then we have um, Peter Newman. Justin Alban. Hi, Ross. Thank you very much. That was really brilliant, fascinating talk. Um, and my question was kind of related to Tristan's in a way, and it goes towards your um, point about um, interrelated teams. And earlier you said that data sets can be shifted to other sorts of drivers, such as social equity. Um, and in that sense, how do you think that maybe that, con that part of this topic has an influence on how we educate architects in terms of ethical considerations? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Justin. Um, well, I, I guess for me, a, a, a increasingly um, 
prominent theme is the notion of architecture as a service, you know. Um, and if if we move completely away from the notion of architecture being this glorious self-indulgent uh, enterprise, which, you know, I mean, I love my profession and I've had the most marvellous career. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of doing anything else, but um, um, I think uh, we've abrogated our responsibility um, by giving over too much technical uh, responsibility to others and therefore it's not embedded in the way we think and work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true of issues of social equity as well, um, that um, we don't think of ourselves as, as, you know, having an influence on that domain in what we do. I mean, well, some do. I mean, obviously, one falls in the trap of, you know, vast generalisations. But um, I think um, in the education environment, um, if we take people from the beginning and start talking with them in a way that they have an opportunity to make a huge, massive and incredibly valuable, important contribution to society, and that they're thinking, they're looking outwards rather than inwards. I mean, a lot of architects are a bit introspective as part of the source of their creative talents, of course. But we have to be thinking um, in, in terms of that landscape of community impact. Um, because quite honestly, the profession should be 20 times bigger than it is. Um, you know, our impact on society should way be way beyond the, the level of prominence of doing um, single houses and additions and all that kind of stuff which so many architects spend their lives doing, which, you know, mm. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting they should be doing otherwise. I'm suggesting there should be much, much more going on. But one of the problems um, um, is that, that it's, a, it's still a very small profession. And, you know, all of the skill sets in the computational world, sorry, Chris, Tristan, for putting computation with this, what I'm about to say, um, you know, goes into efforts like Facebook. You know, if we had a, all of the amazing, amazing, um, you know, engineers and and um, computer geniuses that Facebook had applying themselves to to the massive uh, social and environmental challenges in the world, um, you know, and add to that all of the other digital wallers, um, then we'd be on onto something. The challenge yeah. is that our profession is very small, so I think we also have to think in terms of growing it massively by growing its expertise and, and uh, technical base. Yeah, thank you, Ross. I think the last one would be Peter Newman. Wow, how nice. G'day, Ross. Um, how are you, Peter? What have I done? Can you see me? Yeah. Um, anyway, I uh, congratulations on your amazing career. I haven't seen you that much during it, but uh, saw you at the start of it. Um, and. Um, Certainly, uh, 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 the Peter, you are muted, and uh, your camera is off as well. If you wanted to, got to hear Peter's question. Can't can't wait to hear what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there he is. Okay, yeah, the, the system turned me off. Not very nice. Um, yeah, oh. I was just congratulating you on your amazing career and uh, you talked about um, parametrics and playgrounds and now politics um, and I wanted to follow on that line. The idea of statistics being useful in change and service uh, is certainly something that I have tried to bring to the spatial sciences um, and very early on uh, found that very controversial and the, the, the idea of stories going with statistics became more and more apparent to me that if you didn't have good stories that went with it, uh, you didn't make any change. Um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of political change now in this area and I find the stories actually work better. But you have to have the statistics as a base to yep. bring about that change, working with the public servants and and uh, people with money and so on. You've got to have that, but uh, the stories are the real winner. And that that's the important thing that architects have always done. So I, I wouldn't lose that sense of what you can actually perform and bring about change because of the, uh, you know, the narrative you create. Uh, I totally agree. Um, um, I mean, I think it's part of 
I think it's, I really do think it's, it's such a marvelous profession and, um, and I totally agree. You wouldn't want to lose um, any, any aspects of, uh, of what we've got in, in, to be sacrificed in the service of expanding into the technical technical side of it as, as, as I'm advocating. I totally agree with you, Peter. I think um, good architects are great communicators and, and the whole notion of a narrative and the story um, can be so evocative. Um, so, you know, I'm certainly not advocating that, um, you know, we that architects should be designing less in the way they currently design and, and, uh, and so forth. I think um, um, most architects are pretty intelligent people. I just think we've become a bit technically lazy um, and we've been allowed to really. Um, and I think that, that has to change. And the challenges that are before us, hopefully, will be a great motivation for it. And just to reiterate, um, that, uh, because we're probably out of time now, um, the final point is that um, this transformation, which in one part of the talk I, I, I think I cast as the re-engineering of the profession in education, um, the timeline for it, given the imperative of 2030, and we've already, we've already blown it, but the, the timeline is 2025. So um, the whole of Australia's education, architectural education world needs to be um, producing stu graduating students by 2025 who are fully competent um, in these areas of expertise. You know, call it zero carbon design or something else, but doesn't, and that's probably not the main point, but something like that. Um, and we're also advocating that, arch this is a bit controversial, but it's, uh, it's being fed into the system that, um, architects regis ongoing registration should be contingent upon them having demonstrated skills and participated in training programs. Um, it's part of the reason why last year I put together that zero carbon design series that's now being rolled out by the engineers. Um, the, we can't, you know, that's getting the heavy handed side of it again and I don't think um, we, you know, we shouldn't be too rolling too heavy on that but that's one of the absolute barriers that we're getting ourselves about a timeline. Um, and I think the timeline is critical. Um, and uh, we actually built a, uh, within, with project managers actually, we actually built a fully fleshed out timeline of uh, tasks and deadlines to get to 2030. So I'm convinced it's possible. Not easy, but possible. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it was very informative uh, presentation and conversation. Um, we really enjoyed it, Ross, and thank you everyone um, uh, who participated. I guess we'd better wrap up the session. Um, there are lots of thank you messages for you, Ross, uh, in the chat box that you can read. Um, so much appreciated again for your time. And we'll see you tomorrow at the board. Yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. We might talk about some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it was definitely. Ab absolute pleasure as always. Any, any opportunity, I'll always grab it. So thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. And everyone Cheers. can see the recordings of all the talks um, on architalk.org website. Um, don't forget to have a look. It's, it's an amazing resource. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Bye-bye.